walking off the room. So I, I think it's only fair that a patient organization representative speaks as last. Um, and I hope to be able to present some good examples to you, a good practice, if you like, on how with dedication and um, anger you can achieve some access to information from, uh, from agencies and also from, uh, from the industry. But first of all, I will shortly speak a bit about um, the ATG, the European AIDS Treatment Group, which is one of the largest patient organizations for people living with HIV uh, in Europe. Um, it's, uh, it was established uh, 20 years ago. We just celebrated a couple of weeks ago our 20th anniversary. Um, it was established in Berlin, but right now it works, it, it operates in Brussels in order to be closer to um, Brussels. <laughs> Brussels. Um, and uh, so we have an office there, and we are essentially active in three key areas. These areas are science, policy, and capacity building and training. Now, in terms of science, this means that we uh, operate the ATG, operates um, a separate entity within the ATG, which is called the European um, Community Advisory Board, the ECAB, which, is, um, which has a meeting right now, as I, as I speak, in, back in Brussels, where I will have to return this evening. Um, and this particular entity uh, was set up 15 years ago um, as, uh, as a result of, of the need for information about treatment available for people living with HIV. Um, what this entity does is it uh, maintains regular contact with pharmaceutical companies which are active in the field of HIV and now also in the field of HCV. I don't know hepatitis C. I don't know how much you know about this, but the major cause or one of the major causes for uh, for death among people living with HIV is their co-infection with uh, hepatitis C and tuberculosis. So this is why our remit also includes now um, uh, HCV and some TB work. Uh, we would meet these companies on a regular basis, as I said, every month, every two months, and we would listen to them what they have to say. Now, an important point is that we set the agenda. It's not them, but we. We tell them what we want to hear about. We want to hear about the trials that are going on, about the various clinical trials that they are conducting. We want to hear about the results. Now, these are highly scientific meetings, so it's not just, you know, activists sitting together with marketing people. That is something that we definitely want to avoid, and we have been successful with that so far. But we implement actively something that is called the expert-patient uh, concept. This is actually what my dissertation is about. Um, the expert patient is a patient, is someone who's living with a disease, but has educated him or herself to the level where he or she can become a real expert of his or her disease. Now, I want you just to take about one second and think about yourselves as patients, because I believe that all of you will sooner or later suffer from some health condition. Well, my health condition is HIV, and I felt this pressure. First of all, why did I get infected in the first place? So how can I prevent others from, from getting this infection? How can I do some, some prevention work? And on the other hand, how can I stay alive as long as possible? And how can I live such, I mean, a, a relatively healthy life, even taking my medications, whatnot. But how can I conduct a relatively healthy life um, despite my infection, these were the key drivers for me to get into this field. And these are still, these remain the key drivers for, for, uh, for our, my peers or the members of, uh, of ATG. So in ECAB, we would sit together with the, with the pharmaceutical companies, we would listen to them, and we are critical. That's actually what we do full time. So we would critically read their data, we would analyze their data, get back to them, uh, in the meetings and after the meetings, there's a continuous interaction with the pharmaceutical companies. Now, you know, HIV is, um, is a very special thing. It has always been. It's a very carnal disease. It's, it, you know, it's related to bodily fluids. HIV is about sex. It's about uh, drug use. It's about homosexuality. So all these taboos, it's a carnal thing. 
And this is the reason why it was very easy 20, 25 years ago in the US and also in Europe to make pressure, political pressure. This is actually the pressure that we have been living, striving on ever since. And I want to invite you to think about this, how this can be transferred to other disease areas. We are not quite sure about that, but we are working on that right now, how this can be done. Now, the policy working group, which is another entity of the ATG, works in policy. So we, try to, we work very closely with the, with the EMA, um, and uh, we are one of, one of the patient organizations with a, with a standing uh, place or position there. We will attend the seminar on the, on the 22nd, <laughs> I know that already. Um, so we, we try to uh, influence decision-taking uh, uh, on a European level, and we also try to make sure that that trickles down uh, to, um, uh, also to member states. But our um, uh, geographical area includes the entire WHO Europe area, which is 53 countries. So it's not just, we have members from almost all of those countries. So it's not just the European Union, but Europe at large. Um, and in terms of capacity building and training, this is not just for, for, for the ATG itself. So it's not just the internal thing, but we also do regular training courses, organized training courses for um, for activists in other parts uh, of, of, of Europe. We don't go beyond Europe, um, and, um, but what we try to teach uh, patients and activists um, there about treatment, um, so about the drugs that they take and how they should take them, and also about uh, activism, how to, you know, how to be not just a good activist, but how to be an efficient one, which is uh, not always the same thing. Um, so, as I already um, said a few couple of words about that, this, you know, the will to survive is really the drive behind our work. Um, I, I, I think this is, I think this is self-explanatory, of course. Um, and for that, in order to, to, to stay alive, we need, of course, we need good and, uh, and affordable treatment. And that is impossible without information, and that is impossible without knowing what we are taking. Um, because, you know, this is, um, I'm a social scientist and I look at things a little differently um, than, than uh, let's say, doctors would. But even if you, if you don't make this kind of distinction, if you look at, you know, the regular scales and um, uh, of, let's say, side effects, and it says moderate, di mild to moderate diarrhea, this is a very common side effect with HIV drugs. Mild to moderate diarrhea, do you know what the definition of that is, approximately? How many times do you have to go to the loo with mild to moderate diarrhea? Do you know? Hmm? No? Eight. Eight. eight? It's eight times. Have you ever tried having diarrhea eight times a day? <laughs> it's, not, it's not mild or moderate. It's <laughs> horrific. It actually prevents you from work. It, so it's, it, can, it can be really terrible. So this, there, is, there is a very important difference between, you know, data and the interpretation of data from the patient perspective. And this is exactly what we try to do. Um, right, and diagnostics, of course. It's not self-evident. While HIV diagnost diagnostics can be very cheap, like a normal um, CD4 uh, test or on an HIV test, that's really very cheap. But it's still not available in, in, uh, in all countries, especially now with the, with the uh, economic crisis. Um, so why is open access to information or to data important for us? Um, I already spoke shortly about the expert patient uh, concept. Um, also, um, we deal very intensively with, uh, with uh, uh, intellectual property. I don't know how deeply I should go into this, but of course if you have any questions in relation to that, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to speak about that a little more. We have a paper on, um, on, on access and innovation, a position paper, sorry, on access and innovation, which um, deals with that in depth. So if anybody is interested in that, then I can send that to you. Um, the position paper also describes how intellectual property can be necessary at times. It is, it is something that, you know, we should, we should simply recognize that doctors and researchers and, uh, I mean, in, in, in research will not work unless they get paid. 
So we, you know, we cannot expect from everyone to to work for for free and just out of enthusiasm. So we recognize that intellectual property is necessary, um, and the rights should be protected. But uh, there is a certain limit to that. So we keep, for example, a very keen eye on instances when uh, when intellectual property rights are about to expire, and then just six months before that, suddenly the pills get a different color. But it's the same pill, you know, but you can still try to extend your intellectual property rights and your, and your, uh, and your uh, licenses on that basis. So we try to, you know, try to uh, watch that and try to talk about that with the companies if they listen. They don't always listen, um, but sometimes. Um, so you see, all these, I will not read this out because you can read it for yourself. Um, this, is, uh, this is what we do. Of course, we, we do work uh, a lot with, uh, with publicly available databases because um, right now that's uh, you know, a, a very important tool for, for us. Like Actis, I, uh, Katrina told me not to forget to mention Actis as it was something that was indeed started by the needs, by the demands of, uh, of, the, of the HIV community. And we use that, and we use also other databases, and we try to compare that with the, the, with the data that we um, uh, get from companies. We also got to the point over these 15 years now that we have our members sitting in the SMBs, keeping, I mean, in uh, the, the SMBs, you know what those are? Hmm? Data safety monitoring boards. These are, these are the boards that control clinical trials. There's one for, I mean, there should be one for every clinical trial. Um, which has an ultimate say in whether the clinical trial, they see all the data, um, I mean, uh, also the confidential ones with names and everything, and they can stop trials any time if they find something that's, uh, that's fishy or unsafe. And what is ACTIS? Uh, ACTIS is, uh, what, what's, the, what's the abbreviation, what does it stand for, I don't, I don't recall. It's a database for, for um, uh, clinical trials conducted in AIDS and HIV and AIDS. But you can look it up, and it's it's on it's on it's available on the internet, so you can you can find it there. Um, I just cannot uh, decipher the acronym. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, and we also find that uh, just sitting together with the companies in a very open and I mean in a, in in a declared way is a very good solution for avoiding direct marketing, because as soon as someone comes there and sees these, I mean, sees my peers who have educated themselves over these decades about their disease, and, uh, and uh, there are doctors amongst us, and there are immunologists amongst us, and uh, so they really know their stuff. So as soon as someone turns up there and starts talking, and it is, um, it happened more than once, and it turns out to be just a marketing presentation, then we send them home which is uh, literally we do. I mean, I, I, I've witnessed that several times. Presentations were simply stopped because they turned out to be about marketing instead of science. So we demand a scientific dialogue, um, which is, I think, uh, key for, for, for us uh, in order to, be, to, be, to, to make reasonable um, uh, the decisions. Um, this is why no access to data can be potentially dangerous, what I, what I already explained. You know, um, HIV medication is tricky. You have to take it on time. You have to, you never miss a dose. Yes, uh, you, you, you mustn't miss a dose. Um, and uh, you, preferably, you should always take it on time. So it's not, uh, it's not a very easy um, uh, thing. And therefore, we must know what's, what's going on in our bodies. Um, those are the different ways how we can exert pressure on, on industry if, uh, if uh, they don't comply with what we want. Um, I just rush on, okay? It's, uh, yeah, that's what happened. I've already spoken about that. Um, there are examples of good practice um, that, uh, that uh, we have achieved over the years uh, with, um, with companies. There is one right now, a discussion that I will because of confidentiality reasons I'm not allowed to give details of, but right now there is a discussion going on about one HIV drug-related trial, which we find rather unsafe, and we are about to exert pressure on the company to stop that trial, because we don't believe that it does good 
for the patients. So there are ways, but of course we have information about that which is essential. Um, so there are ways to, to achieve change. Um, read this for yourselves. Um, I already spoke about the, uh, the position paper, uh, which if you are interested in, then I'm happy to send it to you. Um, and yes, so this is um, actually this is what we try to achieve. So we try to be, we try to remain activists, and this is, I think, also why it was um, uh, why why I chose to um, introduce myself here as uh, a person who works uh, in real life and lives with HIV, rather than a than a social scientist doing social science in HIV, uh, because I think it is absolutely important that we are activists. But we try to be organized and we try to do all of this with, our, you know, with, with, with politics and diplomacy on our mind so that we can truly achieve not just confrontation but also cooperation and results through that. Mm. Thank you.